statistical methods. So you close the door, please. Um, so the aim for today is to finally actually finish um, the model formulation part uh, for the GLM. So remember in the first um, lecture, um, I introduced these three steps, model formulation, what was the next one? Yep. And the last one, evaluation all over the nation. Um, exactly. And so far we have actually just introduced a lot of technical things that um, I try to uh, familiarize you with. And um, we, so we haven't uh, reached the model estimation and evaluation part at all yet, but we um, talked about technicalities that are involved in um, this equation, which is the um, um, GLM equation. And so far we have um, basically discussed two separate things, which come also from different mathematical um, disciplines. Um, so we talked about matrix algebra, um, so that um, you know now how to multiply two matrices. And then we talked about probability um, theory and in particular, particular multivariate Gaussians. Multivariate Gaussians. And what we haven't done yet is um, to bring actually um, those two aspects together and discuss also from a intuitive perspective um, what this is now supposed to mean in terms of the model that um, um, has been formulated. And exactly that is the aim for today. Is there anything on so on this thing so far that you feel you need to clarify, which didn't get clear from the other lessons? No, good. Then I just um, start with what I wanted to do today. Um, we will do um, the uh, the whole thing in terms of um, yeah, given. First of all, uh, bringing these two aspects now together and giving the whole thing an intuition and uh, finish model formulation. Um, we will do that with the, with the help of an example. And um, the example will again be simple linear regression because we talked about it previously and because one can easily visualize this and um, because you're also familiar with simple linear regression from your undergraduate studies. So we first have to um, remember um, how um, the X and the beta looked for that. So um, I don't know whether I actually introduced this term formally. Um, so I was called X a matrix or something. Um, from now on, maybe I called it uh, that uh, previously. Uh, X is the so-called design matrix. Um, as we discussed previously, it uh, holds the information about um, the independent uh, um, variables in your uh, model. And um, what we are again interested in today is the um, precise form of the design matrix for simple linear regression. So what was the form for the design of the design matrix for simple linear regression? Please raise your hand and tell me if you know. Nobody's raising their hand. Does that mean nobody knows it or nobody wants to say that? I mean, we talked about it. Um, no, nobody knows that. Okay, then I'll do it. Um, so um, you should remember by now actually um, that the design matrix for simple linear regression um, comprises a column of ones and the values of the independent variable. Yeah. So the, these are these x uh, i's or x1, 2 to xn. 
Um, and um, the design matrix in this case has um, n rows and two columns. Yeah. So that was the design matrix uh, for simple linear regression, which we discussed previously. Um, and you should remember that this is the design matrix for simple linear regression, because how else would you ever be able to evaluate a simple linear regression if you don't know that? Um, the other thing, although there, um, having said that, there was more a joke because you can also evaluate simple linear regression without uh, using a design matrix um, uh, notation. But it's much easier because then uh, if you use the design matrix, then you can do all other um, uh, GLM variants as well. So um, then with um, a specific instantiation of the GLM, of course, comes uh, a specific design matrix, which implies um, also a specific better uh, a parameter vector. So um, what do you know about the better parameter vector? How many entries does it have? You can infer that from the equation in principle, well, if you know that this is a vector, which we also discussed. Please raise your hand if you know that. Yeah. N? N? Ne. <laughs> no. Uh, N is the number of data points. Um, better um, is the um, better parameter vector and in this case has actually two entries because you multiply the design matrix with the better parameter vector and um, if you form a matrix product you can only have in the case that uh, you have um, uh, here two columns and here two rows. It's funny that's always the case so we just uh, discussed that uh, like three weeks ago but I, I, it's not the first time that I realized that somehow it's not you don't get into the learning mood for this course because you have to do all these presentations for the other courses. Anyway, um, so this is a two-dimensional vector. Um, and um, as we discussed, this, these are the values of the independent uh, variable and these um, are parameters. The last thing we also discussed previously was actually the y, which is of course uh, the data. It's a data vector, but maybe before we come to the y, we now um, think again about this um, matrix product of x and beta and um, look at its outcome. So we are now interested in something that I will call mu, which is um, defined as the product of x, so the design matrix, which is now of course our simple linear regression design matrix, and um, the beta parameter vector. So this mu um, has of course um, yeah, how many uh, rows does it have? N row. N row. And how many columns? One column. One column. Um, exactly. And um, what do we have as its first entry? Well, almost. So you just need to do... Hmm? Mm -hmm. Beta 1 plus mm -hmm, exactly. So that's just the matrix algebra uh, part that we um, discussed. Um, for the second entry, what do we have? Mm -hmm, exactly. So um, the important thing is um, what changes is actually the index of the x. This goes on until the last one. What do we have here? Mm -hmm. Good. So this, these are the entries of this um, vector and um, we call these entries um, now um, mu with a subscript. Mu1, mu2, so mu1 is beta1 plus x1 times beta2, which is of course a scalar, because beta1 is a scalar, x1 is a scalar, and beta2 is a scalar, and you just multiply two of these scalars and add a third one. And um, then um, you get a third uh, scalar. Yeah? So we now have um, um, 
basically not not much has happened. We just again looked at the uh, matrix product of um, the design matrix for simple linear regression and the associated um, beta parameter vector and um, have uh, written out that and called the entries of this new vector uh, mu i. So mu 1, 2, 2 mu n. And now um, we can call this actually um, the um, expectation expectation uh, vector, for example, um, of our GLM. And um, we are now um, again, and why it's called expectation vector, uh, it should become clear in a second. Um, maybe before we now really bring it together with um, the epsilon, which we haven't uh, introduced yet, let's uh, again visualize that, although we also did that. So um, if you remember um, here, we have um, the vis visualization of a simple linear regression uh, model um, where we have the values of the um, independent render, um, not random variables, but the independent variable um, xi on the x-axis and um, on um, the y-axis we can, um, for example, in this case, um, now for, um, for starters, um, plot our mu i. And then um, we discussed that depending on the values of um, beta and uh, uh, sorry of beta one and beta two, um, you can have different things. And I'm using a, a simple thing here again. So we assume that our um, let's make it precise. So three, four, five. We assume that our um, beta one. Um, is not zero. So if x1, so if x1 is zero, um, and you multiply beta two by it, um, you get zero. And if you add uh, beta one, um, you get in this case one. So beta one is one, and um, the um, slope of this is just um, one. So that um, if you have one for uh, x1, you get x1 plus uh, sorry x1 times one. It's one plus one, so you get two. And um, we have see what we've seen before. So we see this um, straight line. So this is what we've done before. Um, if there's something unclear about this, please raise your hand now. Not sure whether my constant asking you whether something is clear actually helps or not. But I do it nevertheless. Um, so that was uh, what we've done um, before. And now um, what we have actually uh, formulated um, is a model um, that if we um, fix, um, maybe I should put that also here, if we fix um, a specific set of parameters, let's write that uh, here, better, I call them true but unknown for reasons that will become uh, clearer later. If we um, define these parameters one and one, um, then our model, um, we can evaluate our model and it makes a prediction, which is um, this uh, straight line for each value of um, x, we can compute our mu i. Now, um, do you think that this is a good model for real data? So do you think that this is a theory that um, um, explains data that you can observe well? It's a, it's a stupid question. It's a more re a rhetorical question. But who's, who says yes, it's a great model? Who says no, it's a bad model? It depends on the data. It depends on the data. That's a wise answer. Um, that's true. Um, in general, um, I can tell you from my experience with data that the data really lies completely straight on uh, this line. Um, doesn't happen that often, depending on what you measure. But as we discussed earlier, and physics apparently does, so they don't have to worry about statistics so much. Now, um, I'm telling you, and maybe you've also seen graphs that looks looked a little bit like that, that um, often um, data that you look at 
um, um, so data points don't uh, lie completely on a straight line, but they have um, the feature that they, although there is some um, kind of increase um, of the data points with the values of xi, there's a little bit of deviation. Yeah? So that real data, so let's call this now uh, y. Um, real data often deviate uh, a little bit from such a, a very precise um, prediction. Now, what the GLM and simple linear regression in this probabilistic uh, modeling perspective uh, wants to do is to become a model that can actually, without uh, ever interacting with data, um, make data predictions that look um, like what I've just drawn um, uh, as blue points. And what it does um, to, um, to, that, um, to do that is um, that it assumes that um, the data are generated by adding to each of these mu i, adding an error term. Yeah, so I write that out. So what the GLM assumes here in the case of simple linear regression is that the ith data point is given by the sum of um, the mu i and an epsilon i term. Now this epsilon i term is a random variable. This is why we talked about um, um, probability theory. And um, the idea is that epsilon i is distributed according to a univariate um, Gaussian distribution with expectation zero and variance sigma square. Um, and this holds for i from one to n. So for those who have seen um, simple linear regressions and, and, and thinking about uh, ordinarily squares at this point, we are introducing, so this is for those people, um, we are introducing the normal uh, distribution about the error terms here to be able to later do parametric inference in terms of T um, distributions and F distributions. Um, in principle, uh, you can of course uh, do um, something like regression and on least, least squares estimation without introducing any parametric assumptions about error terms. We are doing that, and when I say GLM, I always mean with the parametric assumptions, because in the end, in fMRI, everybody uh, reports uh, T and P values. And this is only possible if you uh, introduce um, uh, parametric assumptions about these error terms very early on. In case this you didn't really get that, um, that's fine. Um, for you, the, uh, it will now always be the case that uh, and you don't know the other case where you don't introduce these parametric assumptions. Now, what does that mean visually? So, um, first of all, um, or intuitively. So, first of all, of course, our epsilon i um, is, um, oh, maybe I shouldn't put that epsilon i that close. Our epsilon i, because here we have a zero, um, is a real valued random variable which has a Gaussian distribution, um, a univariate Gaussian distribution, like the ones that you are familiar with and the ones that we, uh, where we looked at the um, probability density function uh, last time. Um, and um, its expectation here is uh, zero. Yeah. So most of the probability density um, associated with um, epsilon i is around zero. And then, of course, how broad or how narrow it is depends on the value of the sigma square parameter. Now, if I sample from epsilon i, um, where do I get most of the values if I sample from that? I heard it around zero. Um, so um, this is where if you sample from it, you get most of the values. And um, here you only get a um, few. 
Now, um, another way to visualize that, although it's completely, it's nonsensical, but uh, helpful, is um, to think about it in terms of um, the prediction that is made here. So we are going from uh, one xi to a mu i. So let's, for example, um, look at this uh, mu three here. Mu three, uh, one. No, that's actually mu four. Sorry, um, the x value is three, but it's one, two, three, four. Um, mu four. Um, another way to visualize that is that around this. What oh, is around this um, value? Uh, of the prediction um, um, of the product of the design matrix and the parameter, um, there is a, a normal distribution um, centered on um, mu i because you add mu i to something um, that is centered on zero. We will talk about that uh, later again. Um, and you sample the data point from um, this um, normal distribution, which it's very weird to plot it like that, um, but what you should think of is that this is a, so this thing here is a, a distribution over values, um, which are actually then not mu i, but um, are um, data values. Yeah, And the same thing for the other ones. So that's one way to think about it. Although this kind of plot doesn't really make sense. Um, but um, the important thing in this uh, plot is that um, the center of the um, univariate normal distribution for each of these um, uh, points is always at um, exactly the uh, value mu i. And then um, something is added to it um, that uh, can deviate um, um, from it to the left or to the right. So it can either be negative so in this direction or positive in this direction. I leave it up there, although it's somewhat wrong. Um, to make that maybe very concrete, um, let's do a numerical example. Yeah, sorry. If, for example, higher values of x, the error is getting bigger, so if we have yeah, uh, that's a valid point. Um, this is actually the um, um, a very specific uh, assumption that the GLM makes, namely that um, the error terms are identically distributed. So um, that means that they are um, 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 they don't depend on the value of x. Yeah, one could build that in. Um, so. If you think that this is a, um, a good model for some data, you can build in, um, for example, increasing the variance parameter with increasing x values. Um, but the theory of the GLM, which in its very end leads to the t distribution and the f distribution, and the parametric forms of those, assumes that the error terms are um, identically and, uh, um, distributed. Yeah? Um, let's, before we, uh, other questions right now? No? Good. Um, what this means, just in, in very concrete terms, is that if you um, um, make a, um, let's maybe write that here, um, if you do a um, data prediction, you have, um, as we had earlier, our um, better one plus um, our, uh, oops, two fingers for scrolling. Um, you have um, this plus, and this is what is uh, written here, plus, plus uh, epsilon one. Now to compute uh, y1, what you um, need um, to do is you need to put in your better one value you need to put in your x1 and your better uh, x1 is actually 0, um, 0 and your um, better 2 value. And 
um, you have to obtain a realization of this uh, random variable epsilon one, which is univariate Gaussian. So you need some way of uh, sampling. Um, so for example, using a random number generator or sampling something in your head according to uh, this, which I will now do. And the outcome is 0 0.0, no, 0 0.12. Actually, looking at the graph, um, I revised my random number <laughs> generation and uh, I come up with a new realization, which is minus uh, 0 0.4, which then leads to 1 plus 0 times 1 minus 0 0.4, so 0 0.6. And look, the data point that I plotted here is around uh, 0 0.6. Um, the <laughs> magic. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and um, so the same thing you can, of course, do for the, the other uh, um, um, points. The thing is, and this is now something that you need to um, basically also uh, understand from a very intuitive perspective, is that um, the GLM is uh, works as follows. You assume certain true but unknown parameters which you, of course, later want to estimate, but um, you assume uh, those, then you can um, deterministically evaluate um, the um, expectation vector. So this is completely deterministic. Deterministic. Um, but then to actually um, obtain a data prediction, you need to evaluate um, the value of a um, random variable, which is this um, epsilon, actually there's some other the scrolling today, um, which is this um, epsilon i random variable. And then you have to um, add the value of epsilon i to your deterministic prediction to get actually a real um, 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 prediction. So, so far, to make that very clear, no data has been observed. This all happens either in your head or um, if you have, um, if you know how to program uh, in terms of a, a computer program where you um, sample um, um, data based on this procedure. Yeah, um, questions about this right now or confusion or something. Or why are we doing this? No? Okay. Um, good. So what we already, um, um, or what I already said is that um, the epsilon i's are assumed, of course, this is all a, a model uh, assumption, uh, epsilon i, um, they are all identically distributed. which means that they all um, have as their expectation, um, maybe we write it like this, uh, mu epsilon i, so the expectation of epsilon i is zero, and um, the um, variance of epsilon i is some fixed value sigma square, for example, one, or. Um, 0.5 or something needs to be positive um, and this holds for all i yeah so they all have um, the same distribution what is equally important um, is actually the idea that they are um, independently distributed And about this, we have to talk a little bit more um, and also look at it uh, from the multivariate Gaussian perspective. But maybe let's first um, um, yeah, think about um, why this modeling assumption is made. So um, th the fundamental idea why this modeling assumption is made is that um, with the GLM, you want to um, describe 
of course, patterns in the data. And these patterns in the data, of course, you, uh, for example, here, if you increase X, uh, the value of the um, data um, also increases. Um, the pattern of the data that you um, want to extract, if you want, or um, describe is deterministic. Yeah. So, um, of course, you want to, you have um, now maybe looking from from the whole thing from a um, data analysis perspective. So you have these kind of data points, let's say. Um, well, again, you have these kind of data points. And you somehow want to make the statement that if you uh, increase x, somehow um, the uh, value of the dependent random variable increases. Yeah? So your, your statement, your meaning that you want to ascribe to this data is deterministic. You allow, however, um, with the GLM for some random contribution. And um, the uh, random contribution that you allow for, um, in this case, you take, uh, you make uh, two assumptions, um, or actually three. So um, you um, assume that um, the um, random contribution is um, has a similar function uh, has the same uh, functional form for each data point, and um, you uh, make the assumption that um, it's Gaussian. So you make the assumption um, that it's Gaussian, um, which, if you're a little bit more into probabilistic modeling, makes sense from the um, perspective of the uh, central limit theorem because you can view it as an idea behind the whole thing is that there are additional contributions uh, besides your um, linear predictions um, for each data points that are all, again, independent. You don't really know what independent, oh, you know what independence means, but you don't know what it means for the Gaussian. Um, so there are um, a lot of, for each of these data points, there are a lot of additional contributions uh, which are all independent, which have uh, whatever parametric form. So you don't make any specific statement about that. But if you uh, sum them all up and just look at the um, the resulting um, uh, contribution, then actually the central limit theorem um, um, uh, can, uh, shows that um, the Gaussian is um, the limiting distributions of the sum of all these um, independent random variables, which have um, um, non-specified or arbitrary um, um, distributions. So this is this has now um, so this has just again talked about uh, why things are identically distributed and that they are Gaussian distributed. Now the final thing that we have to discuss is that um, they are independently distributed. What that means, and uh, maybe we have, yeah, I think that's um, the way to go. Um, we focus on two um, predictions here. So that would be our mu1 and our mu2. And um, we come up with a very simple uh, um, GLM where um, the design matrix just has two entries. X, no, sorry. Two ones. And x1, x2 um, also has um, two parameters. Will not really work uh, in this way, but um, that's um, for, for the moment, that's not uh, important because what I want to talk about is um, the, um, re the relationship of epsilon one and epsilon two. Yeah. So the independence uh, assumption that we will have to study in more depth um, means the following. If so, you make the prediction that um, mu uh, one is smaller than mu two. That's what um, your simple linear regression model says. Now, the independence assumption for the error term says the following. If you sample now an error here, for example, because um, the um, realization of epsilon one came out positive, it is not the case that you also always get something positive here. But it is equally likely that you get uh, something here, something here, um, or something here, or something here. Of course, it's again more likely that for the epsilon um, 2, you get something around 0. Um, but 
the deviation here in epsilon one um, and the size of this deviation has no implications uh, whatsoever for the realization of epsilon two. Yeah, this means that um, this is the idea that these two um, um, error terms are independent. Um, one can um, yeah, maybe we. Um, um, maybe we visualize that now. Um, so we now focus on the following. We um, plot our probability density function of epsilon 1 here and our probability density function about epsilon 1, uh, epsilon 2, sorry, there. So then what I just um, said uh, uh, means that if you now think of what I plot in there with this color maybe, um, I'm trying to do the same thing. So they should be all be the same, although they look a little bit different. Um, so this is now a distribution um, over epsilon one centered on uh, zero, so a probability density function to be more precise, um, and um, sigma uh, square for the case that epsilon two came out, uh, um, uh, let's say zero is here, um, that epsilon uh, 2 came out uh, 0, uh, negative then of course, um, minus 0 0.5. I'm doing it the other way around now, so um, I just told you that uh, what it means to, that um, um, here this epsilon 2 is independent of epsilon 1. Now what I'm showing you is uh, the same thing, but um, that epsilon 1 is independent of epsilon 2, so it's um, the same thing. So this is how the um, how it looks, the, the distribution over epsilon 1, and it looks um, exactly the same way if epsilon 2 comes out, for example, 0 0.5. Yeah? So the form of this probability density function is not affected by um, the value that epsilon 2 takes on. And um, the same is true, of course, then um, the other way around. Um, so if we now think this without breaking anything. Um, hello, the altogether we have. You know, think about a distribution over epsilon two. The idea is, and that's what I showed you on the figure before, that um, the probability density function looks exactly the same, roughly. Um, um, independent of, of the value that epsilon 1 may take on. Yeah? So for example, minus 0 0.5 here and here um, epsilon 1, uh, uh, 0 0.5. Yeah? And now, um, the only thing, yeah, so, so that's basically um, what this independence means, so that the probability density function for epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 um, does not depend um, on um, the specific value that the random variable epsilon 1 or epsilon 2 takes on. Now, questions about this? Confusions about the graph? No? Everything clear? Good. Um, the um, this is uh, almost uh, where one then is at the level of bivariate Gaussians. However, this um, what the difference is that of course that this is not so far um, a joint distribution because this shows um, conditional distributions. Now I'm bringing back the stuff that we talked about: uh, joint and conditional distributions. Um, so. If you um, think about it, and maybe let's think about this uh, curve here, um, what do you know about conditional distributions? Uh, how, if you sum up all the values for uh, probability mass function, what do you get? One. Yeah. And for uh, probability density function, you need to integrate, but you also get one. 
Um, so uh, all of these uh, green and uh, uh, cyan or whatever lines that I plotted here, they integrate to one. Um, so they don't describe a um, joint distribution yet. But to get uh, to the joint distribution, um, how do you get from a joint distribution? Um, uh, sorry, how do you get from a conditional distribution to a joint distribution? So how can you write if you have, for example, this uh, epsilon one and epsilon two? How can you write that if you think back about uh, what we talked about uh, in terms of marginal and conditional distributions? Or if you just think about the definition of conditional uh, of, of a conditional distribution, so what's uh, what's epsilon one given epsilon two? How do you evaluate that? Mm -hmm. So, um, and then from this, you can, of course, uh, easily see um, how you, for example, can create um, this joint distribution. How? Maybe continue that. Mm -hmm. Um, exactly. And uh, what I've uh, told you before is that this here, this is actually uh, epsilon 1 given epsilon 2. Um, so it's a distribution about uh, over epsilon 1 um, um, for a specific value of epsilon 2. Now to actually get the joint distribution, uh, what this equation here says is that you have to scale it by the, prob by the marginal probability of uh, P epsilon two, and um, you see um, the marginal probability over epsilon two. Um, of course, you get um, like in our little table, um, you get by summing over or integrating in this case by summing all over the green curves. So what you actually have in terms of the marginal distribution for epsilon two is this kind of thing. Uh, maybe with a little bit of a higher um, peak. So the thing is, the point that I want to make here is that um, the marginal probability of epsilon 2 being 0 0.5 is actually relatively low, which means that if you now plot the joint distribution, you have to multiply this conditional and uh, shrink it. So it um, might look more like this. So you scale it down essentially. And if you now think doing that um, for all the green and sine curves um, that you see in this plot, what you will get is the following. Oh, it's actually the wrong color. It's be yellow. But I have time. I don't know about you. But I take my time here to draw a little thing. So, so what this is actually is supposed to signal, although it looks horrible, looks like a three-year-old drew something. Um, what this is supposed to show you is the um, um, spherical um, bivariate Gaussian. So um, if you look into the um, script, you see the circle, which is uh, yellow in the middle, and then it uh, goes to blue on the outside. And um, what I now intuitively, and by showing you pictures, uh, 
try to convey is that um, if you make the assumption or if we make the assumption that epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 for this case of simple linear regression um, are um, identically and independently distributed, so according to a Gaussian centered on zero with the same variance parameter everywhere, then we get uh, first to this representation and now if we uh, down uh, um, scale it um, down scale the things according to the marginal probability distributions then we get to this typical plot that you see for um, 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 normal distributions in two dimensions um, w um, for independent random variables where um, you basically see a circle which is uh, uh, has a high value in the middle and uh, lower values and um, um, two um, the sides. Yeah. We will have to talk more about this and uh, definitely so the relationship between independent random uh, variables and Gaussian random variables and um, this uh, um, multivariate case. So that's then the aim for the next uh, hour. Um, are there questions about this right now? No. Good. Then let's take a break and continue at short after 11.